Good morning and welcome to this uh, annual business meeting of the Council University of the West Indies. It uh, gives me a special pleasure to welcome those who are viewing this on live stream. For many of us, this is a new experience, and I hope it will be a very salutary experience. First, I'd like to welcome those persons who are attending for the first time. Uh, Ms. Rosa Greenway, the Permanent Secretary of Ministry of Education, and Tegan Barbuda. Ms. June Chandler, Permanent Secretary. Uh, Ms. Minister Floyd Green, from the Ministry of Education, uh, Youth and Information in Jamaica. The Honorable Sean Richards, Minister of Education, St. Kitts and Nevis. The Honorable Sinclair Prince, Minister of Education, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The Honorable Anthony Garcia, the Minister of Education, Trinidad and Tobago, who is our host, and welcome uh, very much uh, to this first meeting. And the Honorable Lovell Jones, who is coming. Sorry, Le Francis. Lovell Francis, I'm terribly sorry, who is here for the, first, for the first time. A special welcome. It also gives me special pleasure to welcome uh, the new Chancellor's nominees to Council, Ambassador Gillian Bristol, Mr. Richard Biles, Mr. Harold Hoyt, and Mr. Russell Martineau, I bid you a warm uh, welcome and look forward to your, con to your contribution. Thank you for accepting it, my invitation to be our nominee. Uh, we have a long and packed agenda, and many of the points uh, to be discussed here obviously will have a major impact on the university in the short, medium, and long term. Therefore, we look forward to your close attention, your closed cell phones, and very careful and studied advice on the many product uh, points in the agenda. When I looked at the agenda and read the background papers, I could not help recalling a recent experience of mine as a member. There's an Oxford Symposium on Emerging Markets where we discuss annually some of the major forces that are affecting, especially emerging markets and in the world as a whole. And a couple of years ago, we discussed higher education. And uh, some of the present agenda items are very reminiscent of those discussions we had in Oxford a couple of years ago. It is clear that we're almost on an, I describe it as an inflection point in higher education all over the world. And I recall discussion on some of the major trends that are taking place uh, that are affecting higher education. And I'll mention four. There are certainly others, but I'm singling out those which I remember uh, as uh, evoking considerable discussion and debate in our symposium. I just mentioned four of them. The first was that the revenue from traditional sources is falling and putting all but a few institutions at financial risk. I'm here, I'm sure you'll hear more about this as far as our university is concerned in the, in the near, uh, during the course of the day. Second, there are rising demands for a greater return on investment in higher education. We have some data on the local returns. Uh, Professor Downs has done this for us on more than one occasion. But I'm sure in the near future, they'll be clamor for better data on the return to the individual and the return to society from investment in higher education. This is rather complicated, but it cannot be avoided. The third point which evoked considerable discussion was the new models uh, for higher education that are gaining traction all over the world. And the fourth one, which uh, probably gained more dis discussion than most of the others, is the rapid accelerization, acceleration of globalization of higher education. And the many major universities in various parts of the world are opening satellite campuses in other countries. In a recent visit to the Gulf, I was amazed to find that there were six major American universities with actual physical campuses in Qatar. Many of these and other trends affect our university and will pose challenges. But at this juncture, our institution is fortunate in having a new vigorous and visionary vice chancellor, who I am sure in the course of the day will tell us of the initiatives to meet these and similar challenges. Last year, I believe I referred to the periodicity of examination of the governance of the university. There were exercises in 1994 and 2006 in which there was examination of the structures, processes, and the forms of organization that were necessary 
for the optimal functioning of the institution. That is, in a general sense, what we interpret it as the governance of the institution. Perhaps such an exercise will become necessary as a result of the initiatives of which we'll hear from the Vice Chancellor during the course of the day. With that introduction, it is my real pleasure to ask our Vice Chancellor to present his report to Council. Vice Chancellor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chancellor. Minister Anthony Garcia, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Uh, colleagues, uh, students, uh, members who are part of this uh, stream community, welcome everyone and good morning. Good morning. This, this report, which is in effect uh, a, the year in review, is much more than a description of the programs and the projects in which we have been engaged in the past year. A fair amount of energy has gone into uh, rethinking the strategy of the university, uh, focusing on the rebranding of its image, and in effect, uh, repositioning the university intellectually and conceptually, as the Chancellor has said, not only in the regional world, but in the global world. So a fair amount of pedagogical and intellectual discourse has gone into the rethinking of what the university is not to be and how we should go into the future with a different trajectory. So much of this presentation then will be an, inter an interface of projects, programs, and reconceptualization, rethinking of the university as we go forward. I wish to draw your attention to the concepts which are formulated here in this slide, the concept of the activist university. The notion of a university constantly, actively engaged in all of the main issues facing this region, all of the major discourses, the, the challenges facing our region, our people, our university as an active force in all of those conversations. Objective, of course, is to rekindle the development revolution of the Caribbean. You know, there is a view articulated by many social sciences that Caribbean development has grown to a halt that Caribbean civilization is an exhausted civilization, that we are tired, that we have struggled hard against colonialism, we have struggled for independence, we have struggled for civil rights, human rights, we have tried to make the best of the independence dispensation, and that struggle in the last 300 years has exhausted us. It has left us tired, it's been a heroic struggle, and now we are an exhausted culture. All views have been formulated in the intellectual disciplines across the world looking at development of countries and why some countries are rolling back, why some civilizations are rolling back. So the notion, therefore, of rekindling that spirit of Caribbean development is therefore critical to the mandate of this university to ensure that we are in the vanguard of the strategies that our people are formulating. So the activist university rekindling the spirit of the Caribbean development revolution. Reaffirming our activism. Universities are not established to serve themselves, and we want to be clear on that. Universities all over the world are established to serve communities and nations. And in so doing, a critical part of that service is in the area of leadership. We have to empower our citizens to feel that they are dedicated to nation building, we have to strengthen that sense of self-reliance within our societies, the sense of sovereignty, that we are a sovereign nation, that we have to reposition our nation in the global world, and that that spirit and that energy of development is always in the vanguard of our consciousness, and the university is best placed to formulate that thinking. And this is the kind of activity we have been engaged in intellectually over the past couple of months. And as you can see here, we have, uh, have a wonderful team. This is, this is the team of the center management of the university, an, e an excellent team, an intellectually uh, engaged team, uh, a mixture of long experience and emerging energy. It's a very good team. It's a very cohesive and coherent team, and we are working together under the Bobab tree. So this is Team UWI. This is the team that generates the energy, uh, my role is to listen to them and do as I'm told. I had the honor and the privilege earlier last year to address the forum on the future of the Caribbean 
uh, here in Port of Spain. It was a very timely uh, forum to address precisely those kinds of conversations. How are we going to reposition the Caribbean world? What really are the systemic challenges that we're faced with? We know that our economies are not as competitive as we will wish them to be. We know that they're not as competitive as we wish them to be, largely because they're not sufficiently diversified to spread their capacity across multiple markets. We also know that some of our more mature and developed industries are in need of refurbishing. We know that. We know a tourism plant, for example, across the Caribbean that has driven development so aggressively, it needs to be recapitalized, it needs to be refurbished, it needs a, a gloss to go back to the top of the world market. These are things uh, that we know. But we also know that innovation and research and the application of research to diversification, very, very important. This therefore creates a wonderful opportunity for the university to reinsert itself in those developments around the Caribbean the search for competitiveness, the search for greater diversification, application of research to project designs, new streams of innovative industries. University has an important role to play in building out the new Caribbean economy. This forum dealt at length with those issues. My role was to reinsert the university into those very important conversations about the new economy of the Caribbean going, going forward. And all of this, we address our primary concerns. The sluggishness of the Caribbean economy in terms of the recovery from this recession. We are among the most sluggish parts of this hemisphere in recovering from this recession. We are all speaking three different languages. There is a language of how to stabilize the free fall of some economies. Stabilization discourse is taking place in some financial environments. In other environments, there is a search for growth, just 2% growth, 3% growth. The search for growth in the economy, that is also very important. But in some other parts of the region, there's also a conversation, not so much about growth. What we need is development. That we cannot abandon broad-based social development for economic growth, though we know that it is long-term sustained economic growth that generates development. But we have to be careful how we handle the social sector, because the surrender of the social sector for the pursuit of the economic growth also generate other systemic problems. It's how we manage all of this. And our campuses have an important role to play in getting these balances right within the methodologies of search for economic growth and economic development. We know the challenges. On a daily basis, we are monitoring within our university all of the reports, the recommendations, the general judgments on the state of the Caribbean economy. Our university is here to participate in the search for these objectives, and therefore, we have to monitor the macroeconomic environment. We study very carefully what is taking place in each and every one of our member nations. And we study these reports within the context of the role that is expected of this university in turning these negative images around. We have seen some of the reports. Projected growth in some of our economies. At best, sluggish. At best, not enough to sustain social development. At best, not enough to promote optimism. This is where our university is at. Our job is to maintain a first-class, first-rate, globally respected university in an economic circumstance that is very disturbing and very, and very troubling. In addition to this, the world is moving on. Global objectives are being set. The Caribbean is expected to play its part in strategies surrounding the future of humanity, the struggle to achieve objectives to save this planet, how to blend social responsibility with material development. Our university, our region have to be in the vanguard of this. How will the university participate in assisting our region to meet all of these objectives? These are the issues that have dominated our thoughts in recent, in recent years, more intensely so in recent months. 
to do this, we must develop in our region a highly sophisticated higher and tertiary education system. We have to articulate all of these systems to provide a capacity for the region. It is disturbing when we see some of the statistics coming out of UNESCO, for example, that in terms of enrollment in higher education, the number of our citizens enrolled in higher education between the age of 18 and 30, that's the age cohort, 18 to 30, that in the English-speaking Caribbean, we are at the lowest level for the entire hemisphere. So you take the hemisphere, Alaska to Argentina. You take enrollment in tertiary education for those young people between 18 and 30, and we in the English-speaking Caribbean have the lowest enrollment rates in the hemisphere. That is very disturbing for us. We are even lower than, let's say, the Spanish-speaking Caribbean, the French-speaking Caribbean, the Dutch-speaking Caribbean. We, in the English-speaking subsection, we have a serious crisis. And that crisis is compounded by the fact that all of the indices of economic development are showing that the potential of a country to, to achieve and sustain economic growth and development is a function of the number of its citizens who have been involved or are involved in higher education. So the implication of our lowly status in higher ed uh, education enrollment is now impacting the sluggishness of our economies to recover. So that when we look at this sluggishness, we look at the lack of diversification in the economy, we look at all of those issues, they all relate to where we are as a region in terms of educating our young people, in terms of having a professional revolution taking place, not only academic education, but professional training, skills training, broad-based access of citizens to skills and to knowledge. We have difficulty, and all of this is now interconnected and holding us, and holding us back. So this conversation here this morning is not simply the university reporting on its internal stewardship. It is about the university recognizing that it is a cog within a wider wheel, and that wheel is not turning fast enough. We started, therefore, to strengthen and expand that capacity. The council has approved Ordinance 50, which has enabled the university to work with all of the community colleges in the region and to work with them and those that are ready and resource sufficiently to transition them into university colleges of the UWI so that they can continue to offer the skills training, the professional training, but they can also offer university degree programs, bachelor's and master's in some areas with our support and at a lower per capita cost than it would be within the campuses. So we are working through all of this and we've had conversations with every single state college to work this through. Just yesterday, the principal of the Open Campus, Dr. Longsworth and myself, flew to St. Lucia to have a conversation with the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College about their transition into a university college and to help them to build a modern infrastructure within that college. We are grateful that the government of Jamaica, through the former Minister of Education, informed the principals of all of their community colleges that the policy of the government is that those colleges that are ready must engage the university and transition to university colleges. I have been reliably informed. Uh, Mr. Green, it's good to see you. And I should say that our junior minister of education, uh, Mr. Floyd Green, who is here with us, and this is a special welcome to him, because he was the guild president at Kayfield campus when I was the principal. And now he's my junior minister <laughs> on, on a trajectory. And it's good to see you uh, studying at the Kayfield campus, becoming the guild president there, and returning to your island to now to be minister of education. And we will have many conversations in the future about these issues. But we're very pleased to know that we have been told that despite the change of government, this strategy will roll forward. And we are going to work with those colleges we met with them last week. We met with 10 principals last week. 
and they reaffirmed their commitment to transition in their colleges to university colleges to help us to build greater capacity at a lower per capita cost. The teacher colleges have especially expressed that interest. My co-college in Jamaica, for example, my co-college is older than UWI by quite a distance. But now they're going to be working closely with us to evolve into a university college, to offer specialized programs, widen their enrollment, diversify their capacity at a lower cost to give the region, Jamaica and the region, greater capacity. This is going to be systemic because what we are speaking about is now building a university of the West in the system. And that system will be made up of the four campuses plus dozens of colleges. Dozens of colleges all articulated across the region to build a university system. And we are working with SUNY University, which is a system of 64 campuses. 64 campuses articulated into one system providing tremendous diversity at reduced cost. This is the strategy that we have adopted in our university to create a system of the University of the West Indies, working with national universities. Because in addition to the campuses and the colleges and many of our contributing nations, there are national universities. We're going to work with them, articulate to create a seamless system of capacity for our, for our people. The whole purpose of this is also to generate growth and development at this moment. It has to be about the engagement of our entrepreneurs, the engagement of our investors, our innovators, how to bring knowledge and research information to bear upon economic development. There are many examples that we have had in recent years to illustrate how we have done this here in this campus. The COCO Research Center, state-of-the-art application of the latest science and technology to the upgrade of the cocoa industry to produce products. This is a highly successful and very respected world institution. St. Augustine, Principal Sankat, I should say to you, we are very grateful that St. Augustine has provided this lead in demonstrating how research, innovation can go to bear on a traditional activity to generate a state-of-the-art uh, industry. We have seen it in a wide range of areas. The, the Breadfruit Conference here at St. Augustine, and if you, if you examine your pelican on your desk, you can see we are celebrating the breadfruit. The tremendous capacity of this fruit. This was brought into the Caribbean to feed, to feed it in slave Africans. That's why it was brought to the Caribbean. During the American Revolution, the food supplies were cut off to the Caribbean. The enslaved Africans were starving. They brought the breadfruit to prevent famine. That's why the breadfruit was introduced from the Pacific into the Caribbean. But now, hundreds of possibilities, from fiber through to um, pharmaceuticals, the full range, the potential of this product is now being realized largely thanks to the research that is taking place within this university. You have not heard the end of the breadfruit. You're going to hear many stories in the decades ahead about the tremendous industrial and health and nutritional potential of this, of this fruit. And I'm sure that most of us here have a close affinity to this product. So alignment of industry and academia is the language of the future. And all of those countries that have achieved substantial economic growth in the last 10 to 15 years and beyond. If you take the Southeast Asia model, rapid economic growth and development, based upon the alignment of universities and industries working hand in glove, together moving research and innovation into product design. This is the future of our university. We have to create that culture where the university is going to be working closely with the industry as a normal phenomena, nothing extraordinary. We were over in China in the commercial industrial park in Suzhou, and the university is in the middle of the factories. The industrial sector is there, and the university is in the middle of it. 
and the professors and the entrepreneurs are having coffee every morning, having lunch together. The knowledge is moving out of the university directly into the factories because that is where the output is. Research, knowledge, production. Research, knowledge, production. That is how they have designed the concept of the future university. We now have to look at the structure of UWI, rethink it, and create a new geodynamic the relationship between, between industry and academia. This is going to be one of our primary challenges in the next 20 years, to rebuild how we conceptualize education and its relations to growth and development. Our campuses are becoming increasingly commercialized because, of course, we have no alternative but to pursue independent revenues, to generate values for ourselves, and to demonstrate that the university itself is also entrepreneurial in terms of its pursuit of revenue. We have now created a new concept. We now have approval for a new concept, professors of practice. This will enable the university to confer professorships on persons who have a proven record of distinction in areas outside of academia, in industry, in the professions, in diplomacy, persons who have established excellence of achievements, of attainment, and who we would wish to work with our university to transition all of that knowledge and expertise into our classrooms. This is an international best practice. It's done in some of the finest universities. We have not invented it. But now we are in a position to confer professorships on persons who meet the normal criteria of the university of achieving excellence and the recognition of their excellence from industry. So we can bring those industrial entrepreneurs, professional entrepreneurs, into the university and help us to transition that relationship. We are all, of course, concerned that economic growth in many instances can in fact lead to social inequality and one of the biggest challenges facing the world today. And the UN is now the champion of this. Why is it that despite 40, 50 years of economic growth and development, human inequality is probably at its most disturbing level in, in the last century? Social decay, rising unemployment despite economic growth, the social relationships of existence are important. The university has to be always speaking about, yes, economic growth, economic transition, economic efficiency, but we have an obligation also to be advocacies of social justice, social equality, promoting the social relations of existence so that we do not throw people under the bus while we pursue economic growth. The balance is very important for the well-being of all of us. And so we have determined that what will now be necessary and critical <clears throat> is for the university to establish a growth commission to look at the issue of economic growth in this region, to see how the research and intellectual capacity of the institution can be focused around the question of economic growth and economic development. I was very pleased this morning when I opened the newspaper and read that the Prime Minister of Jamaica has now established an economic growth commission. And I thought, well, now we have an opportunity for the university to work closely with a national growth commission, hand in glove, thinking along similar lines. The university has to be in the center of that conversation. We have capacities. Those capacities must now be focused. This is not the time for conceptual conversations. This is a time for strategy, research, application, and public discourse that is productive and efficient. And so this is our, going to be our next step along this contribution to this development. But we are also doing this within the context of the regionalization and the globalization of the university. The Caribbean has always been one of the most globalized civilizations of the world. In fact, the historical evidence shows that the, the Caribbean was invented by globalization. 
All of the major cultural civilizations of the world are here represented. This is who we are. Globalization is in our DNA. There is no culture in the world that can teach Caribbean people about globalization. We were invented by it, formatted by it, and we have always been at the center of it. This is the diversity of our societies, the diversity of the membership of our communities, and of course, our global connectivities have always, have always been there. So this comes naturally to us. It is therefore for the university to act upon what has come naturally to us. And here we have uh, Principal Barito of the Cafil campus uh, greeting the president of Panama. Resulting out of that greeting, we now have over 50 Panamanian students at the university. We are looking also at taking that one step higher. We built the canal. We have a legacy and we have a brand in Panama. When I was down there a few years ago, I was pleased to see my great grandfather's name on the wall. He didn't make it back out of there, but the point is we built that canal. We made it into what it is. All of us here have family members who were a part of that journey. We are speaking now of establishing a UWI presence in Panama. They want us to come. They want us to be a part of that. The Caribbean legacy of that nation is a subject of conversation between the president and the principal of the CAFO campus. We are now in the final stages of formulating our relationship with SUNY, one of the most prestigious university systems in the world. A network of 64 campuses committed to research, teaching, global agenda. We met with the Board of Trustees, and here we are with the President of the Board, Mr. Carl McCall. And we have come to the conclusion that what is required now is not simply an exchange of students between UWA and SUNY. It's not simply an exchange of professors between the two institutions. We are going to collectively, jointly build a new institution to be jointly owned and managed by the two of us located in New York. The Provost, Provost Cartwright is taking responsibility for this. Mr. McCall has given us assurance that he will find a building in New York on one of their campuses where the WI will have its split. And we're going to be offering a whole range of programs. The thinking here is that UWI professors will be articulated with the professors of the SUNY system in order to engage the research and the monitoring around the sustainable development goals to make sure that CARICOM is well positioned in the pursuit of those goals and in the monitoring of our contribution to those goals. This is one of the issues. Another issue is going to be the 12 million people documented and undocumented of Caribbean background in the New York State are looking to us, UWI, to enter into New York to facilitate their objectives. Many of you would have seen the meltdown of New York City riots and demonstrations on the streets. Conversations about citizenship. Conversations about marginalization. Conversations about not having access to the resources of the state and the city in which they live. We are going to be in that conversation. And so UWA and SUNY will establish the Institute for Caribbean Leadership and Sustainable Development. This is going to be a transformative institution. Research in marine studies already there, health studies, distance education, and, and leadership. This is going to be a, a seismic change in how we conduct our business in UWI on the global platform. We have already started this in some ways. This was a new and innovative development. UWI, New Brunswick University, coming together to offer degree programs jointly. Programs at the bachelor's and master's level, owned and taught by two universities. We are offering certain skills. They are offering certain skills. When you graduate from this program, you get two degrees, not one. And here you can see 
Here you can see the graduates of the first cohort last year. This is, this is a UWI graduation. I must confess I don't see the chancellor. But the fact is that the chancellor shook the hands of these graduates. And then the chancellor of New Brunswick shook their hands because they were graduating from two universities simultaneously. We now have a remit that in all of our faculties, in all of our departments, we're going to be offering in the future many more of these double degrees. This was the first double degree in the history of UWI. Bachelor's, a master's degree in sports science, jointly offered by UWI and New Brunswick. But we've gone, we've gone a step further. We've gone to China, we've identified partners, and we've built a new institution. I know many of you, when you were young, your parents would say to you that they know you will go far. Well, Chancellor, we've gone, we've gone as far as we can. We, we, we've gone as far as we can. We've gone to China. And we've asked a question. What can we extract from the world economy at this moment to impact Caribbean economy, especially the young people at this stage? And we came to the conclusion that what is required for the young people at this moment is to reinsert them aggressively into the digital world. This is going to be the level playing field that the young people are pursuing. This is where they have an affinity for the manipulation of communications technologies. The whole post-internet PC world, the young people have an affinity. What is missing are the programs and the context. And so having taken that decision that this is how UWI will go into that space, this is where we went, into the Silicon Valley of China and Suzhou. And we partnered with a university there called the Global Institute for Software Technology. And now we have signed an agreement. We have signed an agreement that as from this September, students will be able to enter into a BSc degree in software technology. And it's going to be a two plus two program where you spend two years at UWI and two years in China and Suzhou. So for the first time, our students are going to be graduating internationally in another place under our surveillance. So the students of UWI will complete this four-year degree, state of the art, nothing like it, in software technology, in the Suzhou Commercial and Technology Park. Of course, they will all have to return proficient in Mandarin. This will also enable us to have the skills capacity to attract capital into this region for software engineering industries. Here in Suzhou, if you look at this wall, these are all of the Fortune 500 companies. These are all the major global telecommunications multilateral, multinationals. They bypass the Caribbean, and they go all the way to China for the testing and monitoring of the software. They fly past the Caribbean all the way to China because we do not have the skill sets in the Caribbean to attract these industries. We have to generate the skills necessary to attract the capital to enable our countries to have an industrial capacity in these areas. And if you examine the political manifestos of most of our political parties going into governments, they all pledge to develop capacity in this area. It's important for the university to generate the skills in this region to enable the governments to do precisely this, build industries using software technology. And so we're entering into this space, and our students will be going off to China to do a two plus two degree program. This is just the beginning. Here we are signing that agreement. UWI goes global, the China UWI initiative. We have now created the UWI China Institute of Information Technology. We signed it at KFL, we signed it at Mona. This is going to be a new beginning. But as the Chancellor has said, we haven't, we're not going to end there. We are now getting ready 
to create a branch of UWI in China. And as I speak to you, we are having conversations with the Ministry of Education in respect to setting up that institution in China. Principal Barato has just returned from China. We have mobilized the support of all of our ambassadors in Beijing who are working with the Ministry of Education to provide them with the details so that the Ministry of Education can approve the establishment of the UWA campus in China. This has all been worked out. And what will we do? We are going to provide the Chinese market with new world studies. There is a tremendous demand for the study of the Western world in China. We are going to be one of those institutions that will teach them Caribbean culture and history economics. We will teach them Latin American studies, the political economy of Latin America, Brazil right through. We will teach them the political economy and the politics of North America. We will teach them Central American history and politics. We will provide new world studies for those Chinese students. And we will teach them English, Spanish, and Portuguese. This is what they want from us. So we will give them that content. And in turn, they will give us the software technology that we need. It's a quid pro quo. So we're working this way through, and we're 80% downstream in completion. We also have to take care of the Japanese. We were very pleased when Jamaica signed a bilateral Japan-Jamaica trade bilateral. The Prime Minister then of Jamaica, Portia Simpson Miller, said she would wish the University of the West Indies to be in the center of this bilateral. And provisions were made to insert the university in the middle of that bilateral. And there I am uh, signing that agreement where UWI will partner with a Japanese university to develop a special facility. And we have identified Sofia University as one of the elite universities. And the conversation that took place between myself and the president of Sofia is that we want to push in the area of cultural industries. We want to push in the area of cultural industries. Caribbean's culture, fashion, design, music, the arts, our cultural expression is globally respected and celebrated. But the university is not yet in a position to participate in those cultural industries because we do not have the facilities. This is where we're asking the Japanese to partner with us. Film, animation, fashion, ceramics, fabrics, textiles, music, the full range of cultural industries. We have the potential to generate cultural industries within our region using research well applied. But the technology has to be applied to all of those areas in order to get the results you're looking for. So this is where we're focusing with the UWI SOFIA collaboration. We're also saying that Britain is important in all of this. Britain has a role to play in all of this. And the conversations we're having in Britain, four months ago, I went across to London, pulled together a team of all of the Caribbean professors in British universities who are professors in STEM areas. All the professors in Britain from the Caribbean who are professors of mathematics, physics, engineering, and all of the applied and pure sciences, met with them in a the team and said, we, we wish to work with you in setting up a STEM initiative for the West Indies to allow those diaspora students in Britain, as well as our own students to interact. And we held the meeting at University College London. So now we are working with University College London to see how we can establish an institute for STEM education in which UWI and UCL will partner in the area of STEM education. Again, recognizing that this is an area of deficiency in the Caribbean. We do not have a large enough pool of professionals in the areas of applied mathematics, 
physics, biotechnology, and so on. This is where we are going with this international initiative. And so the strategy, Chancellor, is that we are going to be activists. We are going to be in the vanguard of all of the major discussions, strategies, challenges. And here we are demonstrating this, the sargasm threat to our blue economy. We didn't sit back and participate in the wallowing about how our beaches are being destroyed by the spread of this sargasm. We already had the research capacity in the university anyway. We know exactly what is causing this. We know what is happening, the trajectories, the plans, the traditions. And at KFL campus, Principal Baratro organized a sargasm conference, pulling together all of the best researchers in the world, in the world, to come to UWI to talk about how we are going to get around this. How are we going to air pre prevent it if we can? We know what's causing it. What are the strategies that will be developed de develop in each country to protect our beaches? And this is not only in the islands, this is in the greater Circum Caribbean. The Mexican government says they are spending $12 million a day to clean their beaches. $12 million a day to clean their beaches. It's a terrible, terrible development. But the UWA has gone one step further. The principal has said that this is a natural resource. Her colleagues have said, this is a natural resource. We're going to eat it. We're going to turn it into pharmaceuticals. We're going to turn it into cosmetics. And there are students at UWI who are getting ready to patent products that are based on this raw material. Because the scientists have gone to work to identify its ingredients, its constituent parts. And we are going to take a biotechnology approach to this and find ways in which what can be seen as a God-given resource to transform it into products and industrial activity. The Zika outbreak, again, university activists. Professor Clive Landis here has mobilized in symposium the finest researchers in the world to come to the university to give our region a head start of this virus. The potential danger of this is not lost upon us. We already see the effects of this. But we had a major task force where we brought all of our health ministries, our health providers, our health researchers, our government forces, CARICOM. We put it all together to say, this is what is coming. Let us understand it. Let's prepare for it. Let us build resilience in this region because this is on its way. And it's coming big. Because of that engagement, I think our countries are now clearer we have established a portal under his leadership where all the ministries, all the health professionals and practitioners can go to the portal and see the latest research, the state of the art analysis, what is coming out of WHO, what is coming out of PAHO. We now are in a position to help to manage the impact of this upon our communities. We inserted ourselves at an early stage ahead of the disaster to build, to build resilience. We saw the impact on Dominica, Hurricane Erica. We, we, we didn't wait. One phone call to the Prime Minister that says, Prime Minister, tell us what you need. And we're going to send exactly what you need. You want engineers? You want people to help with the purification of water to make sure the water is drinkable after it's been contaminated? We have water management skills. All those buildings, the schools, the hospitals, all the buildings that have been destabilized, we have to certify that they can be used. We have the engineers. We have the farmers. We have people who specialize to help the farmers. We have psychological counselors. Some children lost their parents. Children are traumatized. We were able to put together a team of psychological counselors, water management people, engineers, doctors. We sent an entire team in there to help Dominica to get through this. And now we are working with the government on a sustainable development strategy to rebuild Dominica. And not just to rebuild it as it is, but to imagine a new Dominica. The government has said, 
we want to imagine a new and more resilient Dominica that we want the university to help us to work this through. A few days ago, I met with Baroness Scotland, the new uh, Secretary General of, of the Commonwealth, a Dominican. She has given her word that she will identify the rebuilding of Dominica as a strategy for the future. Building materials, setting standards. Many of our citizens are living in communities perched on cliffs in the water, on water courses. And we know why that is so. That's the history. That's the history of the poverty. Locating people in unsustainable geographical areas. The weather changes, people die. The landscape has to be looked at again. It has to be surveyed. The country has to come up with an optimum system of housing redistribution to protect itself from natural disasters. These are the issues in which we are going to help Dominica to rebuild a new concept of development, especially in the area of housing and community development. Of course, we brought the attention, we brought the attention of the world to this matter to make sure that Dominica was not left behind. We brought the attention of this catastrophe to the world with a globally streamed televised cricket match. UWI Legends, and we do have Chancellor UWI Legends. UWI Legends versus a Dominica Prime Minister's 11. We raised a fair amount of money to help the children and the schools, but the point is the whole world was able to focus on Dominica's needs. And there we are, uh, the, the fearsome duo, Beckles and Ambrose, uh, uh, opening the bowling, uh, an act of terror upon batsmen. But our research continues to impact upon the world. I'm going to give you a head start on this, but you're going to hear much more about it, this research project at the university at the KFL campus, reversing uh, type 2 diabetes. And the project which is there developed, again, Professor Landis, the Center for Chronic Disease Research, collaborating with the University of Newcastle, coming up with a strategy to reverse this epidemic of type 2 diabetes in the region, and to do so using a clear and precise scientific understanding. 60% of all the people in the Caribbean, over 60, are affected by this, by this disease. It is very chronic indeed. In almost every family, we have members who are afflicted by this, by this disease. And this joint research between the UWI and Newcastle have found a part of the answer. You've been identified, diagnosed. We can put you through an exercise regime, and we can put you through a diet regime and with discipline and compliance, this can be reversed, clinically proven. This is very significant indeed. It can be reversed. And how to do it? Professor Landis can tell the world that we have found a way to do this. With a good regime of effective low-carbohydrate diet exercise, we can reverse this in adults when it's identified. Put them back on a health stream. This is revolutionary. And we're going to hear a great deal. And we thank, of course, our partners at Newcastle University and Mr. Granston of, of Virgin, who have invested in this, in this research project. Food security is a major issue in our region. All of our campuses are now involved in research uh, in food security, not only uh, the use of agricultural products, agrotechnology, but also the consumption of foods that are very important to us. We are at the center of research in the health aspect of consumption of foods. St. Augustine has launched this agricultural innovation park. Application of the latest science and technology to agrotechnological implications for farmers. Transitioning our farmers from one level to another level using the technology and science. This also is innovative, revolutionary, and working again with partners in China. The China Agricultural University, the UWI, working together to create an innovation park. There will be many more of these in the future. The 
energy research. All of our campuses are engaged in energy research. But here's the issue. We have the science. We have the science in our university to drastically reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. We know exactly what needs to be done. We have the science and we know how to have the technology. What is missing is the capital. In all of these instances, a major capital investment is required in the immediate short term to get the long-term benefits. We have the science, we have the technology. We need to attract the capital to make the investments to free this region. University is at the center of this, of this energy solution uh, to the region. This is one of my favorite projects. The principal of Mona got fed up with water shortages on his campus. Students complaining, not enough water. Not enough water to keep the environment beautiful. Not enough water to keep everyone satisfied. We are in a water scarce area of the world, classified technically as water scarce societies. The Mona principal became fed up with all of it and decided he is going to drill his own wells and get his own water. Major project. Major project. The Mona campus will now be in a position to export water because underneath the campus, millions and millions of gallons of water, God-given. The principal went down 800 feet until he found it. <laughs> and he's found the water. The water is now gushing out of the ground at Mona. Mona is now water uh, sufficient and will be exporting water. But I have told the principal, this is not Mona's water. This is UWI's water. <laughs> this is UWI's water. So when Kayfield that has water problems right now, <laughs> scarcity, Mona, you have to find a way to get some of this water to the Kayfield campus. But this is where we are. An activist university, an activist principal, partnering with an international consultant firm to solve a problem on his campus and also, also in Jamaica. We are focusing on the youth. The youth. We are focusing on the next generation. Very important to us. And this is why when the Secretary General visited the Caribbean, we said to him, Mr. Secretary General, we would like you to speak to the Caribbean youth. We would like you to give a message of encouragement to the Caribbean youth, speak to the Caribbean youth. And so we organized a regional forum. We hooked up the technology right across the Caribbean, from Belize to Jamaica, right across. We took him into an auditorium at Kayful Campus, and he was able to speak with young people right across the Caribbean, Jamaica, Belize, right through, and engage them in conversation about how they are going to see their future as citizens, their responsibility for nation building, how they understand the challenges facing their countries, and it was a very rich and productive conversation. The young people were inspired to participate in that exercise. We need to have a lot more of that dealing with our young people. When President Obama came to our campus at Mona, met our heads of government, again, the president express satisfaction with the idea that he would wish to speak to the young people of the region. And so we had a town hall meeting where the president was able to address the young people. It was the most remarkable conversation about the future of this region. He inspired those young people that they are the custodians of the next phase of nation building, and therefore they must keep their chin up their minds open and think of the future constructively. It was a wonderful engagement, and we thank the president uh, for that conversation. The Open Campus has gone a step further. They have said, no, we are going to provide the pedagogy content. Open Campus has launched a bachelor's degree in youth development. We all know the challenges of focusing our younger people at this moment of development. We know the challenges. We understand on the ground the issues of alienation, increasing crime, the victimization of young people by 
older people, using them to carry out activity that is not wholesome. We know the issues, but we need programs to help to focus them on what the objectives are. The Open Campus has done this. This is now available to all colleges, campuses across the Caribbean and beyond. And so we are reaching out. This project is not only revolutionary, but it is transformative of young people. The Mona campus, going into a historically disenfranchised community on its border, right next to the campus is the community called Augustown, a community of peoples who are materially dispossessed, but they are on the border of a campus. The campus has taken responsibility for the children in that community. And so the campus went in there, engaged those young boys and young girls on the block, on the block, brought dozens of them into the university to expose them to a skill, animation, making film, making video. Here's the technology. You young folks do not have the formal education because many of you have not gone through the school system. But you have imagination, you have creativity, you want to be good citizens, we'll find a way, the Mona campus found a way. The August Town Film Project is one of the most successful projects anywhere in the world. The graduates of this film project are now starting up their own businesses. Many of the things you see on Jamaican television, these are the kids who are now making those. They're making the ads, they're making the videos, they're making the, the soap operas, they're behind the cameras, they're editing, they are now engaged. The government of Colombia have said, we want this project. And so a team went down to Colombia to take the kids on the block, expose them to technology, make a living, expand the imagination. This is a very important project, and we have a great debt of gratitude uh, to the Mona campus and to Ms. Professor Boxel, who is the, the, the architect of this strategy. The university, therefore, must not only be an excellent university, it has to be an ethical university. That is how we have to be seen as an ethical university as well as excellent in our teaching and research. This is an example of how we participate in the Toronto Sick Kids strategy. Thousands of young babies afflicted with all kinds of challenges. We have the science to offer those children a better existence. And so we're working with our Toronto health professionals to develop a global strategy. This is a very important program indeed. Again, the Open Campus are working with the government of Jamaica in the development of a program for transitional living for children. But promoting global justice is important. UWI and the Caribbean cannot just be part of an economic system. It has to be a part of a philosophical system. In this 21st century, we are looking to rebuild humanity at its highest level. The best security we have as small developing nations is to be members of a world that promotes humanity, that promotes human civility. And, and thus, we have been engaged in conversations about the history, the legacy of slavery, colonization, indentureship. How can we make the world a better place? I have been on the lecture tour there at Oxford, at Harvard, the, the, con the Black Congressional Caucus in Washington, speaking about education, history, and the enhancement of humanity, equality, and justice in the world. The Caribbean is best place because there is no part of the world that has seen the greater injustice against humanity than in the Caribbean. That's our history. So we are in a position to speak of the other dimension, humanity at its best. We are in a position to speak about that because we have seen in our history humanity at its worst. That is important, a mandate for our university. Here we are celebrating that. Mr. Danny Glover came to have a town hall meeting with students, to share with students. Yes, I'm a global superstar. Yes, I'm a successful Hollywood 
actor, director, producer. But here you are speaking with students. How was that done? What were the costs? How did you stay focused? How did you carry your skill into the world at a higher level? The students wanted to hear his story. The students had a right to hear his story. They wished to be motivated, and he was able to motivate them in town hall format. The one university, the one university working in an activist format. And so we have established a task force to examine the, in, the reintegration of the operations of the university, one university cooperating across campuses. This is the task force that looked at ways in which, to, for the purposes of reducing costs, increasing efficiency, forging the university back into a collective sense of itself across its campuses. The open campus, our fourth campus, in its first stage, there were challenges surrounding its operations. We were able to put a task force together under the chairmanship of Professor Wendt to come up with strategies and ideas to help us to re-energize the open campus, to reduce its cost, make it more efficient, to strengthen it, and more importantly, to bring it to the center of the University of the West Indies because this is the future of the University of the West Indies, the open campus. Re-energize it, restructure it, look at the governance model, make some recommendations, let us get the open campus back on track out at the center of the university's operations. The report has been submitted and Professor Wint will speak to this. We are all now part of a new communications world. This is live stream. We are now, we have taken the decision to share this university with its constituencies. We are prepared to be fully accountable to all of our communities. Whatever we do, however we use the public resources, we will make our explanations available to the public. We will stream all of our major university meetings so that the public can express its right to know what is going on within its university. But critically, we have also signed an agreement with the Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation, CMC, Caribbean Media Corporation. We have signed an agreement to establish the UVTV. And so we're going to have our own channel. We're going to have our own channel to carry the content, the most extraordinary content of information that is accumulated in the Caribbean takes place within the university campuses. All of that content has to be made available to the public. And so UETV will go live in August. And the content of the university was the conferences, the workshops, the book launches, the speeches, the discourses, we will run that on UETV so the public can see exactly what is going on, not only in our university, but in universities around the world because we will sign arrangements with other universities to bring content into the Caribbean. This is a very important project for us going forward. Our final frontier, sport. We announced a few nights ago that we will, in fact, develop a faculty of sport. The Caribbean is one of the richest areas in the world when it comes to sport and talent. There is no civilization in the world that produces as many globally distinguished sport performers per capita than the Caribbean. In almost every major sport, we have great persons, men and women out there, performing on the world stage. We need a faculty of sport to drive this process. We were very pleased when, how many of you saw Mr. Carlos Brathwaite hitting those four sixes to win the World Cup for us. How many of you saw that? Okay. How many of you know that Carlos Braffitt is the university's cricket captain? There you go. Disconnect. Disconnect. Carlos Braffitt, the Cavefield campus cricket captain. We brought him to Cavefield, to the university, made him captain, taught him, trained him, brought Ambrose from Antigua to train him. How many of you know that the captain of the test team, Mr. Jason Holder, is a university student? brought in to train to lead for the future, a new leadership paradigm for West Indies cricket. 
research horn within our university. This is where we are. Mr. Usain Bolt, Shelly Ann Fraser Price, the fastest humans who have ever lived, all members of our university community. We are very proud of the contribution we are making to sport. There are two of our principles surrounding the fastest man in the world. And as you can see, the two principles are smiling with glee to be standing next to the fastest human who's ever lived. Celebrating him, celebrating what he represents. We have wonderful facilities in our university. The plant on all of our campuses has been growing beautifully. We have a modern plant. The University of the West Indies, in terms of its infrastructure, is a modern university. And these facilities are getting better and better. And we will continue to engage conversations with our private sector and our governments to make sure that this state-of-the-art plant is used for the best possible purposes of development. We will work with our governments to redesign and purpose fit these new facilities. We have a conversation here in Port of Spain in respect to Pinal de Bay. We are going to turn that with the conversations with our stakeholders into something that will be state of the art for the Caribbean and the national people. We will bend it into shape. Here on the right hand side is the old Sachikor headquarters of Sachikor Corporation. Beautiful, old, beautiful building in Bridgetown. 1840s, the headquarters of Sajikor. Sajikor has signed an arrangement to give us that on a 40-year lease. We will now transform that building into the Center for Technology Software Development. The Chinese are due to arrive in Barbados in the next couple of weeks to turn that historic building into a state-of-the-art software technology incubator center for the university. Insurance spawning software technology and university development. All of these new facilities will be repurposed to serve national and regional development. The Usain Bolt Stadium at the KFL campus, one of the finest stadiums in the world, overlooking the Caribbean Sea. The 100 meter track, the finishing line is facing the Caribbean Sea. So as you go through the tip, and you put up your hand to celebrate the record you have just broken, you are looking right into the Caribbean Sea. The architect has been magnificent. It is, it is beautiful. It is as if you are running into the ocean. Can't wait to jump in the water. Break records while you're doing it. There's the Pinal de Bay at the St. Augustine campus. These facilities, which we are going to be working through to make sure they reflect the best possible use for this country and region going forward. And finally, Chancellor, this is what we have. A university of just under 50,000 students distributed as follows with the St. Augustine campus as our largest campus. We expect a great deal of St. Augustine. In the first 50 years or so of our existence, the Mona campus was the largest of our campuses. And in that environment, Mona has led with great distinction. Mona has led this regional university with great distinction. St. Augustine is now the largest campus. And we expect a similar distinction from this campus in leading as the largest campus in terms of student enrollment. There are distribution per faculty and so on. And I come finally, Chancellor, to our strategic plan. We will hear a great deal about this plan from the Pro Vice Chancellor for planning. Suffice it to say that we are now getting ready this summer to roll out the next strategic plan 2017-2022. And this is going to be the core of the next strategic plan. We're calling it the triple A vision. Widening access to tertiary education, greater alignment of our university with industry for wealth creation. Wealth generation is vital to this region. 
and alertness to global possibilities. And so we're going to expand the capacity in the region. We're going to align our university to industry much more, much more intimately. And we are going to be even more alert to global possibilities as we internationalize this university. And this is going to be the triple A strategy that will be at the heart of our next strategic plan going forward as we serve, as we serve this, this, this region. So, Chancellor, I think that sets the stage for what will happen tonight as we celebrate uh, the Give Back Week. We have very good reasons to celebrate. And here we are in New York, our foundation in New York, celebrating raising thousands of dollars for needy students. We had a great celebration. There you go, Ms. Montano, being honored by the American Foundation of UWI. Great artist, great artist, conscientious citizen, speaking on behalf of the Caribbean youth and being celebrated by all of us uh, in New York. Then we move on to Canada for the celebration, raising money again for our students, raising thousands and thousands of dollars for our students uh, in, in a gala philanthropic, philanthropic event. But the celebrations in New York and Toronto, let me tell you, the respect, the respect that the corporate communities in those cities have for our university. When your leading entrepreneurs, your political leaders, when they all come out to say the University of the West Indies is a great university and we are honored to come to its support, pay thousands of dollars for a, a plate of wonderful food to make sure we raise a lot of money for our university. It is, it is wonderful to see that celebration. There on the bottom screen, some of the finest uh, public leaders uh, in the country come in to support us. The Chancellor is very happy, as you can see, the result of this fundraiser. We launched the Give Back Week in Jamaica two weeks ago. And we're going to launch it here uh, tonight. And we thank the minister for agreeing to do this for us and, and with us. Reaching out not only to our alumni, but to our corporate friends, our institutional friends, that this university must now be a part of a collective responsibility. We give and we ask to receive a little to rebuild the university going forward. This is going to be very significant. And we are, we are connecting we are connecting that conversation to the issue of emancipation from slavery, from indenture, from the history, taking responsibility for ourselves. Here is a major corporation, JMMB of Jamaica, making a contribution of one million US dollars. One million US dollars to the give back, the, give, the giving fund to help our students. It's a major endowment. Major endowment indeed. And on that note, colleagues, we will see all of you this evening as we launch here in Port of Spain the Given Week. This Given Week is going to be part of a precursor for what will be a UWI capital campaign in two years' time. In two years' time, UWI is going to be 70 years old. And we intend to roll out a major global capital campaign to expand, upgrade, make more sophisticated the UWI. And then all of you will be with us as we partner to achieve that objective. So we're taking this step by step. So Chancellor, I thank you for the generosity of your patience, colleagues. Uh, good morning. I know I was probably a bit longer than I should have been, but we have some good news to report, and I thank you. I think the warmth of the, of the applause is an indication of how much you appreciated that sweeping presentation by the Vice Chancellor of the university as it is, university as it will be. And as another leader once said, what is that house on the hill that which we would like to reach? So let me thank you again, uh, Vice Chancellor. And let me entertain any comments, questions uh, from the members of council to the Vice Chancellor about his report. In case I can't, I, see you at the, the registrar will assist me in saying who, whose hand has been raised. 
Please, Minister. First of all, let me commend Sir Hillary for an excellent presentation. I believe that he has articulated the vision of the University of the West Indies quite well. We do associate with a number of the issues that he raised with regards to the way forward for the University of the West Indies. However, I want to make two comments. The first one relates to the discussion centered around the upgrading of the various state colleges or tertiary institutions into colleges of the University of the West Indies. While we do welcome this proposal, I think we should be aware of the various discussions taking place with a number of colleges and universities in North America with a view to establishing relationships with the same um, state colleges. In our case, let us say the T.A. Mauritius Community College. And some of the models um, that are presented are quite attractive. Um, we know that some of our people in the, in the region do have this bias um, with regards to external um, education going out to the United States or Canada. Not that it may, it's better than UE, but it's just that mentality that, okay, the, there might be a preference. And in one instance, um, a reputable institution is offering the two plus two, and a number of students are expressing interest. But we have decided not to sign an MOU as yet, because we want to know exactly what UE has in mind and whether um, there will be any conflict with such arrangements and what UE is proposing. So this is the first thing I think we want, to, um, we want to discuss. Because we are not satisfied with the performances of some of, well, I will say in my case, the, the um, TA Mauritius Community College. Because year after year, we graduate hundreds of students many of them with associate degrees in business management. But my concern, because again, my background is more economics than education. You graduate with an associate degree in business management. Where is the business to manage? I think you know, we first have to start establishing businesses in the region, um, fostering that spirit of entrepreneurship, yeah? creating businesses, and then we could look at the whole complex model of managing businesses. So I think that focus is something we have to look at. Um, and that leads me to the second point I want to, to raise. The alignment between industry and education, academia. And you made mention of the issue of food security for our region. I just want to give you again the Grenada experience here. We are known in the region as the Isle of Spice. But unless something is done urgently, we will lose that reputation as the Isle of Spice. Because for hundreds of years, we have been producing spices, widery. Herbs and spices in Grenada, I think, is well, it, we are well known for that. But we continue to export nutmegs and cocoa in crocus bags for after all these years. We have become victims of international commodity, pri commodity price fluctuations. Case of nutmeg and cocoa. These two commodities, they take over five years to mature. Whenever the price goes up on the international market, everybody rush to produce nutmeg and cocoa. Then the price falls. And everybody abandoned nutmeg and cocoa. Yeah? So there's no stability whatever. But we do, know that, we do know that if we can get involved in secondary, tertiary you know, processing, then there will be some element of stability for our farmers. 
but that is not happening. For the past several years, we have been asking, we have been calling for the establishment of a center for research into herbs and spices in Grenada, and nothing has happened to date. I'm glad to see you know, that um, here in Trinidad, some research is taking place in cocoa. I'm asking, where is the Grenada cocoa in all of that? Because we produce premium cocoa, which is used to flavor um, cocoa in the national market. So I'm hoping that there will be some linkage and we could benefit out of that. Um, and therefore, I am fully supportive of, of those initiatives, but we want to see more action. There's a lot of talk happening years after years of research, and, but I'm not seeing any practical application of those, those things. But I'm happy, I'm glad to, 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 to hear what you have said. I, I like your vision, but I think we need to get more um, practical in terms of applying some of those theoretical models in terms of linking industry to education and ensuring a higher level of, uh, higher standard of living for our people in the region. I thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, they, I'm going to suggest that we have a few comments and then perhaps ask the Vice Chancellor to respond. Mr. Hill. Thank you, Chancellor. And when the Vice Chancellor started off with the activist university and knowing his history and intellect, I wondered where we were going and I'm pleased that where we landed. A tremendous amount of uh, intellectual breadth in terms of what we're, where our university is going, how far it's going um, to China and elsewhere. And I want to speak to you about the elsewhere because of a certain hat that I'm aware. But I want to identify especially with um, Principal MacDonald, that water project at Mona that you say first is for Mona, then it's for Yui, and you skipped out Jamaica all in the end. You just made a little reference at the end. Well, give my new role as chairman of the National Water Commission and National Irrigation <laughs> Commission. <laughs> I'm going to have a long discussion with Principal MacDonald, um, really and asking you, uh, uh, Vice Chancellor, to really take a look at how we do water, if you'll allow me to, to use the term in the West Indies, and especially Jamaica, because it's an important part of our growth agenda. We cannot grow our economies without we get us getting water right, especially in Jamaica, we, I know that. And then finally, just want to make sure I get the name of your council right, because as you know, this week, um, Prime Minister Holness um, announced, as you said, uh, his uh, economic growth council, something that I've written on extensively as my good friend here, Richard, beside me, Richard Baz, who chairs our or EPOC um, uh, committee in Jamaica. We are, EPOC e is economic program um, oversight. oversight committee, Thank which, you. which looks o over our IMF program. And I've done, they've done tremendous service led by Richard. Uh, we've been at, um, we've been at good, good friends in the press. Um, but to say that, I'm pleased that, to see that you've named that, um, that you set up that, uh, that committee because Yes, we have to obviously make sure our economies are, are, are run properly. Fiscal stabilization is important. But when you have a country like ours that has had average growth of 1% or less over the past 40 years, this is, we just have to get there. And finally, sir, um, Chance, Vice Chancellor, will we get a copy of your speech? Council members, I'd love to have a copy of it, soft copy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Chancellor. Vice Chancellor, I just wanted to say, um, well, thank you very much for the presentation. Every time I've heard the Vice Chancellor speak, I feel motivated to know that the university has visionaries who would push it forward. Um, and I just want to say two things, though. One is a comment, and the other one is probably a question. Um, just to say that I was very pleased when Dr. Anthony asked the university to get involved with looking at the Black Sikatoka problem in St. Lucia, and the university did. So I just want to inform the minister from Grenada that the university does get involved, and um, because Dr. Anthony, as prime minister, did ask the university to look into the whole idea of the, the Black Sikatoka in St. Lucia, and the university partnered with the country. And today we can say that we have, to some extent, contained that 
that problem. Um, the, the question really is, um, Vice Chancellor, the whole Caribbean is moving towards this citizen by investment program, you realize. And I just wanted to get a sense of, probably because we, we're looking all over sometimes for information as who has it, but it's really something that the Caribbean governments are doing. And you see St. Lucia is one of the latest countries to come on board. So I just wonder where the university comes in preparation for um, something like this, because it probably is where the governments are looking to see to create employment for its people. So I just wanted to ask, where is the university in that regard? Thank you very much. Uh, BC, would you like to rec re uh, comment on those for that first round? Uh, thank you, Chancellor. Um, uh, Minister Boswin, um, in respect of the, the relationship we are trying to forge at a different level with the, with the community colleges to bring them forward, uh, the, the concern you express is one that we have spent a fair amount of time trying to dispel. In December uh, gone, I was invited by two colleges in Jamaica to address their graduation ceremony. They were graduating students from a program that was jointly offered with the Connecticut State University, the Connecticut Central State University. So these students were taught in the college in Jamaica and also taught in the college in Connecticut. They spent a year in both places. My task was to celebrate that, that these colleges ought to do exactly what the university is doing, which is to establish global partners, global linkages. We have given a mandate to all of our faculties that each faculty must have double degree programs with other universities. So we want the colleges to do just that. And so the, the framework that we have been discussing with the colleges to upgrade them explicitly specified colleges will be urged and encouraged to build links with other universities. And we will help you to do this because we have links with hundreds of universities all over the world and we will want the colleges to reflect what we do. So by becoming a part of a university college of, of UWA, in fact, encourage the college, put some mandate on that college to look beyond itself and beyond UWA. And so we will work with you on the quality assurance issues, on the accreditation issues, to make sure that those relationships are well governed, to make sure that the relation between the college and any university in the world meets the best standards, but we will help to govern that with you and for you. So the concept then of the colleges is based upon helping them to become global. And these are the conversations we've had with all the principals that the UWI has just established a post called Pro Vice Chancellor for Global Affairs. This is the first time we're having a Pro Vice Chancellor for Global Affairs. And the PVC for Global Affairs will be helping those colleges to look into the world and to shape their new program. So have no fear, we, we are not promoting parochialism. We are promoting the global reach of our institutions in this region to make sure we build capacity with local resources and international resources forged together into the growth of a new capacity. That's what we're trying to do. Um, in respect to the, the college, we would love to work with the government to transition the Murray Shaw College. As you know, I made a visit there uh, some weeks ago to meet with the management to look at the facilities. We heard from your minister, from your officials in the ministry, your colleagues, of these international plans you have. And we want to help them to pursue them. So we're all on the same page in respect, in respect of that. In terms of the alignment, the, the full security institutes of the campuses are working uh, to, to find the best technologies to apply to these agro, agricultural circumstance. At the Kefal campus, the head of that institute is Professor Ogara, who is a Vincentian agroeconomist, and he is uh, looking at ways in which to work with farmers right across the OECS. We can probably give you more of that information, but it is true, as you have said, that this is the beginning. The COCO research project on this campus is fantastic because it has already 
form, it has already evolved to the level where it is generation, generating a high quality chocolate. Uh, the last occasion we met Principal, you provided us with chocolate, beautifully packaged, ready for export. Uh, we've not seen any this time. But, but maybe what you can do before we uh, finish our meetings today, you, you can send across to the Institute and, and you can make some, make some chocolate available uh, to our colleagues as a sample so that the minister can understand that we are in the export business already. We have a beautiful product and we are going global with that fine Caribbean chocolate out of the St. Augustine campus. We're going global. Um, uh, minister Lewis, I thank you for your intervention. The issue of citizenship and investment is a global conversation. Uh, many of the developed countries of the world have been practicing this strategy for 50 years. Right across the North Atlantic world, uh, major investors are brought into a close relationship uh, with citizenship and the state. This is, this is nothing that the Caribbean is inventing. Uh, you are coming in the second phase of what has been a global practice for some time. The, the, Sun, the Suridaf Ranfil Center for Trade Policy and Trade Law has been looking at this on a global scale. What I will do is to find a way to make sure that research is made available to you because it is a global practice. The conversations in the region uh, uh, have not been as focused as, as they ought to be, and I think that many Caribbean governments are receiving a bad press in respect of how it's been interpreted. But we need to format that language to show that this indeed is a global phenomenon and that the governments of the region who are looking to this strategy are just involved in a competition in relation to with other countries that have been practicing it for some time. So we will give you the relevant information that we have gleaned from the global research. I thank you. I'm sure, Mrs. Sinhill, that uh, the Vice Chancellor takes your comment on board and appreciates that you speak not in a parochial uh, out, uh, sense, but uh, as a genuine concern for the regional nature of the institution, we understand that. <laughs> yes, and Chancellor, I forgot to respond to Mr. Hill's uh, intervention. Um, yes, it is, it is indeed Jamaica's water. So, so, so have, have, no, have no fear, have no fear. What, what, we, what we're trying to avoid is, is uh, a, a circumstance where, where the, 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 full, the full identity and the full rights of UWI, that all things on the land and beneath it are also a part of UWI. But importantly though, yes, we have centers for water resource management of our, on our campuses. We have centers that specialize in water resource management on our campuses. We have experienced researchers and professors who specialize on this and who are globally respected for their work. So we have the expertise that can be made available to you in your new capacity as the chairman of the Water Commission. You can draw upon all of this research in UWI as you roll out your new strategy. We are here, we are here to, to assist you. In respect to the forum, the language that we are looking at, we are considering uh, the UWI uh, Economic Growth Forum, uh, which would be a, a, a place where all of the national growth strategies can be discussed and debated and articulated, so that the, the group of experts that we will assemble will also be available to, uh, to the Jamaica government, because this is what we're here to do to provide the multidisciplinary expertise to help with the formulation of the new strategies that are evolving. So, so um, we are here, and the university's forum will be launched uh, in very short time. Thank you. Minister Roberts and then Dr. Dawson. Thank you very much, uh, Chancellor. Um, I'll take this opportunity to commend the Vice Chancellor for his uh, comprehensive presentation and to associate myself and look forward to the activist university, so to speak. I would also like to um, commend the university and the work of the chancellor and his team for looking at the university colleges, so to speak. I think um, discussions throughout the region in terms of um, the way forward uh, and the sort of amalgamation of the university and these colleges in the various islands uh, it's very important. Uh, there is no need for duplication or competition, so to speak, but we should work collaboratively in order to provide the type of training and the type of expertise for citizens. 
I'm also looking forward to the reports and the findings from the Economic Growth Commission and the forum. Uh, while it's a, not a one-size-fit-all, but I'm sure that we all can learn quite a bit from those findings moving forward. Um, I also note the uh, whole issue of the diabetes re reversal studies in Barbados. I think it is something that um, we've got to get a driver to champion the cause throughout the region because, as we know, diabetes is one of the leading causes of, of death and other um, health issues. Uh, I must commend you for the comment you made in terms of the open campus being the future of the university going forward and note with the BS C degree in youth development, it is something that we in the small islands look forward towards. Uh, I must say in Anguilla, we are pleased to note that the open campus has been able to offer the PhD in uh, education leadership. Um, uh, we would like to see it expand much more to the other islands because in my generation we had to leave and be all over the world, nomads, so to speak, to get a tertiary education. and. Um, you know, advanced education, and we can do it right at home. And that in itself shows, uh, in part, the activist nature of the university moving forward. And I commend it a whole lot. The Augustown um, uh, Film Festival, or film group, again, is another initiative that I think um, needs to be put in the forefront. And I await the University of the West Indies TV program so that we can put all of these things out there, so to speak. The Faculty of Sports, again, is another brilliant initiative. A uh, little place like Anguilla, we are able to produce record holders and um, representatives of Great Britain and the Olympics and so on and so forth. So I commend the uh, notion of the Faculty of Sports. And we await the Triple A strategy 2017 to 2022. And I pledge our full support in terms of uh, the University of the West Indies and the programs and the outreach uh, programs nationally, regionally, and internationally going forward. So thank you. Thank you. Dr. Dawson and then uh, Minister Jones. Thank you, Chancellor. Of course, I represent the Association of Caribbean Tertiary Institutions, uh, which has traditionally have a very strong link with UWI. And I, too, commend the uh, Vice Chancellor for an excellent presentation, but the view from, as you would say, 50,000 feet, that it was broad in its scope and future-looking, anticipatory about world conditions and, and needs, what needs to be done in the region. My line perhaps would be along what seems to be the more popular line, the whole regional tertiary education system and um, the way forward with that. I, I commend the initiative because in a region where resources for certain things are very scarce. We have to be very innovative. That's how we approach them. And I would like, I've heard the talk relative to the initiatives between the university and particular institutions. I'm not sure to the extent though where there is a collective conversation where certain things as far as the development, I know the input from SUNY, which I think would be very, very vital, but there seems to be also the need for collective conversations with the regional schools um, so that it is not so much about what is happening at exactly at a particular school, but how can we build something that can be framed broadly. And I would just like to, again, um, commend and say that the ACTI would be very, very willing to participate and help to facilitate those conversations so that we can build something from the ground up. The policy level seems to be working, moving along, but if it's going to work, the institutions themselves are who's going to make it happen, and we're happy to work with you to try to ensure that takes place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dawson. Minister Jones? Thank you very much. Our Chancellor, I've listened quite carefully to the Vice Chancellor. And uh, obviously, he comes from a proud tradition of persons from the rural sector of Barbados who are, in fact, accustomed to the service of sound. And those gentlemen whose, and ladies whose education was seven standard in the use of that phrase within the Barbadian context would recognize that he has said a mouthful, also from grandmother, the phrase a mouthful or an earful. 
But there are certain realities which confound us. I, I, I praise him for so many imaginative pathways, really, to university po progress, all the island, all the progress of all the islands of the Caribbean, particularly the English-speaking Caribbean, but we're not leaving out those who speak other languages as well, maybe Dutch or French or Spanish. I, I praise him for the initiatives with Seju in Japan, SUNY, New Brunswick, all of them. It demonstrates our capacity to reach beyond our own shores, our own very small shores. Uh, but there are going to be some sacrifices when you look at the very broad picture. Because even though the university will be an activist university, will be seeking to motivate governments, NGOs, all of what make up the, the Caribbean and the social sphere and the economic sphere. The reali reality of the university in the Caribbean is that it is operating with extremely slender resources. So in order to reach the crest of where it wants to reach, something will have to give. What will give? Caribbean governments have gone through pain. Pain, because I don't believe any government likes to send home people cut at 15, 20% of salaries and all of that. So in order to build out the university to do what it has to do, will we be doing like Caribbean governments have done and throw some of our people out to pasture? Because people take money to survive. They take money to be employed, to be professors and clerks and office professionals and security guards and people who will manage water, regardless of who the water belongs to. So what will happen? Something has to give. I'm hoping that it is not human resource that has to give. Because the Caribbean is not going to be able to be turned around in under a decade. We fight powers and principalities and wickedness in high places, both internally and externally. We've gone back to the days where money now is placed in large suitcases People walk on airlines or take small boats and move it from country to country. Not because anybody wants to practice illegality, but because there are large countries who care not about us and the movement of our resources because they see us as scoundrels. They see us as laundering money when they are the largest launderers of money in the world. So we are placed even further along the periphery than we've been placed before. And yet we create that excitement in ourselves, that enthusiasm in ourselves, which should not be forgotten. Important because that's who we are. Our journey of the people of the Caribbean is one of being plucked from thousands and thousands of miles away of Africa, Asia, Europe being plucked. And we try to make a a reality, but the forces still work against us. How do you talk to those forces? Since you want to make this university the activist university in the region, but the activist university beyond the region, how are you going to be able to help the minister, and I'm going to choose Barbados, <laughs> of finance and of education. Well, don't help me. The union is helping me. Um, or wherever they are, to, to understand these realities, to interface in relation to these realities. We applaud Obama, President Obama. But yet he sits 
in a government structure that bastardizes the region. These are realities we have to face. Yet we go to the OECD, and they squeeze us even more. They are inserted in the midst of all of this. To survive, we reach out to China, and long may they live and survive. They're doing some things. Obviously, they're doing those things within their self-interest, and there's nothing wrong with self-interest. Nothing wrong with that at all. How do they hear our voices, make sense of our voices, and provide the fair means? We are not begging. We just want fair means to achieve what we want in this region. And so every time we, we seek to set up a citadel, that citadel is knocked down or not being able to be built because somebody else creates the damage to what we do. I hope in these exercises we are able to speak more and more with the political leaders of the region to reinvigorate the partnership necessary for the realization of Yes, the university project in its widest sense, the regional project in the widest sense, but also the individual nation's project, which must contribute to the overall project in the widest sense. If we see the university only within the university itself and the, 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 the alterations and the changes, um, pieces to make a whole, then we are going to be making some errors that are not going to be easily corrected downstream. It is upstream where we have to make the adjustments, looking holistically, one, protecting our human resource <coughs> that you would have built, educate, develop, enhance, whatever word you want to put in there, to make it workable. I, I say those things because of my own vantage point. I am I am growing even more so so now sir I, I cover my hair. It, it, it's not it's not like yourself, sir, that still wear a reasonably good head of hair. And my, my PS was whispering to me and I wonder he's happily married. Happily, I, I as far as I know, sir, you are. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> but I, I, I'm serious about about the point as you restructure, as you look at enhancing the resources mm. as you look at m m ensuring that we get more and more of our young people mm -hmm. into, into wider uh, tertiary education. But we have to consolidate the base that feeds that at a higher level. And there are still severe problems at our base. Because if the base isn't strengthened, we can get the quality young people to enter our university to become serious and sustainable researchers and to, and to really look out or participate in the development of the Caribbean. I strike a chord, yes, of enthusiasm, but the practicality of enthusiasm, mm -hmm. but I also strike mm -hmm. a chord of mm -hmm. let us do it in a mm -hmm. manner mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. taking everybody on board and realizing the dreams mm -hmm. of everyone Mm -hmm. Not only in this room, but across the way of the Caribbean. Thank you very much, Minister. Before you respond, uh, Minister Garcia, and then I'll ask you to give a comment, VC. Thank you very much, Chancellor. I always take great, play, great pains to ensure that my contribution follows that of my very good friend, Minister Jones from Barbados. <laughs> you know, once we enjoyed a very good relationship, I'm not sure the extent of that relationship now after hearing him speak. <laughs> but I want to make a, a few points, really. The first point I wish to share with you is, like others, I want to congratulate the Vice Chancellor for his comprehensive report and for the vision that he has shown to us today. I think his presentation was excellent, and for that, on behalf of the government and the people of Trinidad and Tobago, I'd like to Thank you very much for that presentation. I would like to inform the meeting once again that in Trinidad and Tobago, we have three 
universities in operation. The University of the Southern Caribbean, the University of Trinidad and Tobago, and of course, the University of the West Indies. When we looked at the decision to establish a faculty of sport at the University of the West Indies, although initially it appears to be a very good idea, and in fact it is not the first time that I'm hearing about it, in discussions with the, the University of Trinidad and Tobago, this is an initiative that is also been undertaken by the University of Trinidad and Tobago. And as the government's representative for both universities, I would want to suggest that we have some discussions because we don't want it to appear as though we are competing against each other. We have resources that we want to share, and I think it is important for us to have a synergy where that is concerned. So that is one point I wish to make. The other point I wish to make, of course, is one, one, that, is one that I made on the last occasion in Jamaica, and that is our government is having some concerns with respect to the Pinal DB campus. As I had indicated before, I had some initial discussions with Sir Hillary, and we will want to continue those discussions. It isn't that we want to stymie the efforts of the university in, in its expansion efforts, <coughs> But there are some concerns and some considerations that we must bring on board. So again, I want to express the hope that we can have some discussions. Now, I also noted that today, at this meeting, the announcement of the principal for St. Augustine campus will be announced. And uh, I would want to take the opportunity to, as soon as possible, to engage the incoming principal in these discussions so that whatever we do and wherever we go, it will be a smooth transition and our, the, our government's views will be taken on board. I wish to reiterate, it is not our intention to stymie the efforts of expansion, simply to discuss some of the concerns that we have. And thirdly, as we face severe economic problems, I want to suggest that there is a renewed focus on revenue generation, especially since, in our case, in the past, you know, we were able, Trinidad and Tobago were able to make substantial contributions to, towards the university. And now, because our hands are almost tied, we have to look carefully at our expenditure in all aspects, and I'm sure this goes for all other territories. So in, in, in terms of revenue generation, I would want to suggest that we look at that even more closely and look at the initiatives that might benefit not only the region, but also our people. So these are the three areas that I would want to share with you this morning and I look forward to further discussions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chancellor. Um, I, I would wish to uh, assure uh, colleagues that in the development uh, of initiatives and, and policy frameworks that our primary focus is, as I said uh, in the early part of the presentation, that the whole purpose of UWI is to, is to make more sophisticated that culture of service, that we we focus on doing what we can in the service of all of our region, and that is what we will continue to do with the resources that you have made available to us. And to that end, I was pleased to hear Minister Roberts speak that there is some satisfaction in Anguilla in respect to the effort that we have made to, to build out the presence in one of our smallest and most beautiful islands in Anguilla to tap into the, the skills and uh, the resources there to build, to build programs. Um, uh, Director Dawson, we are also engaged in building the, the university network across the entire Caribbean. 
as you might be aware that this year um, I'm the president of an organization called UNICA, which is an association of universities of the Caribbean, uh, Spanish Caribbean, French Caribbean, uh, Dutch Caribbean, the entire region, including Central America, Mexico, uh, Venezuela, that we are building those bridges across all of that space. So UWI is now plugged into a network of over 50 universities across the Circum Caribbean, including the mainland Caribbean. And this is something that we are working on to build capacity so that students in the English-speaking Caribbean can go to uh, Venezuela, they can go to Mexico, they can go to Colombia. And we have already networks of students moving across the space as I, as I speak. So yes, the UWI is a part of a a broader regional regional system of universities. Minister Jones, I, I thank you for your comment. Um, we, we, we focus uh, always on specific projects that are facing regions, whether they be health issues, uh, energy issues, uh, challenges in relation to education, the cost and, and the funding. And I entirely share your view that one of the things we ought to do is to help to shape the global landscape that uh, should give primacy to fairness, to, to, to equity. And it is true that as the, the economic world of preferences have been abandoned, and the, the countries of Europe especially that did develop a certain preferential structures of trade and investments in the earlier time have dismantled that, what we must receive in return for that is a world that is based upon fairness and, and equity uh, so that when we have access, we are not unfairly denied the access. Because on the one hand, you cannot dismantle the entire structure of preferential relationships, and then at the same time also dismantle a system of equity and fairness on the level playing field. And I do agree with you that it, it must be considered as an act of hostility. And it's the, 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 the definition of globalization has to be, I think, be precise. It is a double-edged sword. Because while on the one hand, the economics of globalization are pulling in one direction, the politics of globalization are pulling in another direction. But the, because it is because the nation state remains the fundamental building block of globalization. So that, in effect, what you have is the, the politics of rich and powerful countries versus small and vulnerable countries. And that really is the challenge that we, that we, are, we are dealing with. Minister Garcia, um, ha have no fear. We, in rolling out the, the sports initiative, this will be a, a, an elegantly crafted Caribbean strategy to mobilize the best across all of our colleges and universities. We are very aware of the work that is being done at UTT. We are very well aware of the work that has been done at the G. Foster College in Jamaica, which has already built tremendous expertise in sport. So we have pockets of sport and expertise in many of our colleges across the region. At the moment, we are all interacted. We are all collaborating right now. We talk to each other on a daily basis. Our programs and our policies are interactive. Our scholarships are interactive. The university's role is to pull all of that together to make sure that it is seamless. At the moment, for example, we are offering bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, and PhDs on all of our campuses in sports medicine, sports law, sports management, sports science, biomechanics, all of that is being offered right across the university system. And in addition to the university system, we have colleges like UTT, G. Foster and Jamaica that are also specializing in aspects of sports. Our strategy is to frame all of this into an interactive system. So yes, we will have those conversations at the level of ministers. We will have that conversation with the principals of all of those colleges so that what will emerge will be the best use of all of our resources and the capacity. So the merging and articulation of the regional capacity into a unified structure is what we are trying to achieve so that our students have and our professors have the, the, best, the best possible access. 
in respect of our, our campuses, <coughs> we recognize that in this recessionary circumstance, public accountability for the use of scarce resources must be based on the assumption that those resources are going to give each country the maximum possible benefit. And therefore, the way in which we develop facilities must be held into account in respect of the impact that is value for money within the country. And we can only do that by having intimate conversations with our, with our stakeholders from the public sector whose resources we are using, as well as resources from the private sector that will collaborate with us going forward. So again, we reiterate the, the final expression of the use of our campuses and the new infrastructures will have to reflect that consensus that we are seeking to achieve to give maximum satisfaction. So, Minister, we will have ongoing conversations in respect of that specific issue that you have mentioned. Thank you very much, Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor. I'm sure some of these topics will resurface during the course of the uh, day. I'm going to suggest that we have a break now. <laughs>